So welcome to part two of my side-by-side -side comparison of the same battle in D&D 5th edition and Pathfinder 2nd edition, which is the third course in my Pathfinder Law School series. In that first video, I tried to present as objectively as possible the same mechanics, the same things happening in both combats, but being resolved in different ways by the two systems. In the comment section to that video, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of great observations from people comparing what they see. Here in this video, I will give my own presentation, uh, giving a bird's eye view, and breaking down the differences between the two systems as shown by the side-by-side -side comparison. It's not strictly necessary to see the f actual combat in order to follow along. However, it is going to enhance your understanding of the points I make. First, I want to make a general observation about the level of complexity in the two systems. I think that they're both complex in the overall tabletop RPG spectrum, but in different ways. A majority of people who play tabletop RPGs today play Dungeons & Dragons as their first system because of its brand recognition and it's so ubiquitous. It has a reputation of being rules light, of being easy for people to pick up and play. Pathfinder, in contrast, has a reputation stemming largely, I think, from first edition Pathfinder of being complex, hard to learn, having lots of math, and that's why there's the nickname Math Finder for the game. We definitely see that from the demonstration. Instead of checks having advantage and disadvantage, we saw modifiers that could stack and combine with each other. The multiple attack penalty also meant having different attack bonuses for the same weapon attack and puts a premium on writing down your attack bonuses in advance. Also, the resolution of checks is more complicated because there often are four degrees of success. There often are ways to critically succeed on something and to critically fail. And also, when you see the d20 roll, you often don't automatically know which of those four degrees of success you've achieved. Usually, you have to add it up and compare it to the DC. You can't usually eyeball it, usually. There is some getting used to that, and when I started playing Pathfinder 2e, it was a noticeable extra step, particularly when playing in person. A virtual tabletop can do the math automatically and quick in play. Another thing we saw is that there were generally more rules. The things you did often had a rule for them. Pointing out a enemy you have detected to your allies, for example, had rules for it. Your allies needed to be able to see you, and they needed to be in a position to detect where you are indicating. Also, many rules have traits. When the goblin pulled out a weapon that had the manipulate trait, which is a trigger for the fighter's attack of opportunity, this means that there is a learning curve to learning the system. It means that the game master usually does not have to make up rules and balance the game on the fly. And it means that both the players and the game master have a common thing to refer to to know how the vast majority of situations can be resolved. Dungeons and Dragons is simpler with regard to these things. However, it has its own forms of complexity. Whereas Pathfinder has the three action economy, in D&D you have four different buckets. There's the action bucket, the bonus action bucket, your movement, and one object interaction. If you want to stow away your weapon and pull out another weapon, that uses your action bucket, and you're not able to make an attack that turn. You could, however, cast Healing Word as a bonus action. If our fighter levels up and takes a level in Cleric and has both Second Wind and the Healing Word spell, he would not be able to do both things in the same turn. If, on the other hand, that character had prepared Cure Wounds instead, a healing spell that uses their action, they could have cast that. Also, there's some complexity introduced by the concentration mechanic. You cannot maintain more than one spell that is a concentration spell. So this affects your spell selection. Also, some spells are bonus action spells and others are action spells. Whereas in Pathfinder, you basically just need to know how many actions a spell costs. And there's no limit on the number of spells you can cast during your turn in Pathfinder either. You can cast three one-action spells if you want to. Our Pathfinder cleric had the Bless spell cast, but would have been able to cast other spells with the duration like Guidance or Bane while Bless was still up. We'll find generally that there are fewer rules in D&D, that they're less precise, 
and there are areas where there's no rule for it, like our situation with the goblin hiding and trying to sneak away. These things then become left up to the dungeon master to make a call. And from table to table, different DMs might adjudicate the same situation differently. This leads to a situation where many DMs house rule. There are many DMs, for example, that let you drink a potion as a bonus action. This leads to more inconsistency between table to table. Often a first question that D&D players will ask any dungeon master that they meet is, what are your house rules? Because of this culture of house ruling, a number of the rules that are written in the D&D rule set are not implemented by a number of tables. So in this demonstration, some of the rules that I went through are ignored. When you actually go by the rules, there is not a huge gap in the amount of rules load between the two systems, as the reputations of the two systems would suggest. And depending on the table, some people might find Pathfinder's rules simpler and easier to grok than D&D's. In the spectrum of TTRPGs, D&D 5e is actually not a rules light system. For that, there are systems like Powered by the Apocalypse, systems that are called narrative first games, that have fewer rules that are less combat focused than D&D. And compared to true rules light systems, there's a danger that your house rule or your call that you make in 5e could lead to a bad precedent in a future situation. So it's a tricky uh, balancing act that one needs to be a experienced good DM slash kind of a game designer to run well. While D&D might be easier for a new player to pick up, there is more expected of the dungeon master to make calls and to fill in holes where they exist in the rules. Now I'm going to cover some specific areas. First will be ambushes. In Dungeons & Dragons, when one group surprises another, there are two things to determine with relation to each character. One, whether they are surprised, and two, whether they can see the attacker. They have different mechanical effects. The goblin's stealth roll at the beginning made it so that the rogue was surprised, but none of the other party members were. Surprise had the effect of denying the rogue the ability to do any actions, even reactions, before the end of her first turn. However, when a goblin attacked the rogue, even though she was surprised, they did not get advantage against her necessarily. They had to also be unseen by her. Hiding behind a tree and firing a bow while hidden? That has advantage. Running out with your sword and attacking does not have advantage. In Pathfinder, there simply is just no surprised condition. Everybody gets to act during the first round. The advantage that the goblins got by ambushing was that they got to roll their stealth for initiative and get the cover bonus to their initiative rolls, which were stealth rolls. It allowed them to act earlier. There is no separate surprise condition in Pathfinder. There's just having a lower initiative. Also, it was likely that they were hidden to the target when they started acting. Whatever they were shooting at was flat-footed to them and got a minus two circumstance penalty to their armor class. I'm going to express some opinion here and say that I think Dungeons & Dragons system is more complex, except for the cover bonus to initiative for Pathfinder. It's hard for me to accept that one character can be surprised and an attacker not have advantage attacking them, while another character is not surprised while an attacker does have advantage in attacking them. Now we look at the action systems. In D&D, you have different parts of your turn, and the main things you do are your one action and moving up to your speed. The reaction everyone can do is opportunity attack. Added onto that, like ribbons, are the fact that you can interact with one thing during your turn, and you can do one bonus action if something is a bonus action. Generally, in Dungeons & Dragons, you cannot exchange these things for each other. However, if you want to do something twice, like move twice or interact twice, that costs you your main action. So as we saw in the example, there are some turns where a character does only one thing, their action, and doesn't move. While the cleric on its turn, they got to do a bonus action healing word, walk toward a goblin, interact with a hand axe, and use their action to attack with the hand axe. 
part of the game of the action economy is to use all of your action types when possible, especially your bonus action. If you don't have a bonus action from a class feature, you definitely want to try to find one or learn a spell that lets you use your bonus action. This fact makes bonus actions inherently more powerful because they do not compete with your main action. So things like Second Wind, Healing Word have greater value than they otherwise would. It also meant that our goblins were somewhat unique in that they had a bonus action that they could use. They had their nimble escape ability, which let them disengage or hide as a bonus action. It meant that there was more movement in this battle than usual fights with monsters in 5e. In fact, most of the monsters in the monster manual do not have bonus actions. The number of action types is less than what existed in third edition D&D. It's simplified in that respect, but not as straightforward as what's in Pathfinder where all three of your actions are simply actions. It seems simpler, but in practice, it does mean that you are sometimes more limited in what you can do, particularly if you are used to Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Some things that were quote-unquote free, your movement or an object interaction, each cost an action now. It sometimes feels like you're doing less on your turn, but other times it feels like you're doing more. One effect is that since these actions are so precious, it is possible to make an enemy do less on their turn by denying them an action. Knocking them prone, for example, means they have to spend an action to stand up. Walking away from an enemy means they have to spend one of their actions to walk up to you. Also, while Pathfinder's action system might be simpler to explain, decision making might be more complex because many of your actions compete with each other for your precious few actions. Already we saw our cleric when two allies were downed being conflicted about how many allies to heal, whether to cast a spell, whether to move towards an enemy, and then later whether to attack two foes versus healing the rogue. And this is all true at level one. As characters level up and gain more things that they can do with their actions, they're going to have more things competing for their actions. I'll say there is one clear advantage, at least in my mind, which is important to me, is that if you're running a game of Pathfinder, you know when a player's turn is over. You don't need to ask them if they're going to use their movement or if they have a bonus action. The moment they do three actions, I just call on the next person. Next, we deal with modifiers. Dungeons and Dragons boils down the vast majority of buffs and debuffs and situations into advantage and disadvantage by making the roller roll twice and using the higher or lower. This is clearly more simple and elegant and easy for new players to learn. There is one clear minus to this, however, in that it's less precise. When you have one advantage effect and one disadvantage effect, they cancel each other out. If you have multiple reasons why a check should have advantage and only one reason for it to have disadvantage, the system still has them cancel each other out. Also, it's very powerful. So the system is necessarily pretty stingy with giving out advantage and disadvantage. In many instances, its effect on a roll is to apply a plus five or minus five. Also, there are still pluses and minuses in D&D. Firing past another creature, even your own ally, gives a plus two bonus to the target's armor class. There are many other effects like guidance, bardic inspiration, spells like divine favor and bane that add or subtract to checks. In contrast, Pathfinder embraces the bonuses and penalties from previous editions, especially third and fourth edition. They, there are different types at play here, unlike with the action system. The number of types is vastly reduced. There was perhaps a dozen that I remember being used commonly in third edition, but now it's reduced to pretty much three types. Status bonuses and status penalties embrace things like spell buffs, spell conditions, lasting bonuses and penalties. Circumstance bonuses can usually be explained by the immediate situation. So raising your shield and standing behind cover both give you a plus two circumstance bonus to your armor class. 
If you're standing behind a tree and enemies are trying to fire arrows at you, raising your shield does nothing because it is the same type. Item bonuses and item penalties we did not see in the demonstration. They tend to come from magic items. We also saw untyped penalties such as the penalty from the range increment from the short bow, and we also have the multiple attack penalty. There definitely is more complexity here, and not every table may like this. While it leads to more math at the table, this also incentivizes doing more things on your turn besides I attack. Because of the multiple attack penalty, you are incentivized often to spend one of your three actions setting things up for your allies, like demoralizing an enemy to debuff them because those things do not suffer from this multiple attack penalty. And this is true even starting at level one. You want to shift the math. And that leads to our next topic, the critical successes and failures. In D&D, you get a critical hit only by rolling a 20 on the die. And a natural one always misses when you're attacking. And these results on the die only have a special effect when you're making an attack roll or doing a death saving throw. Whereas in Pathfinder, there are many more critical successes that happen, both because you only need to roll 10 above the target number, and also critical failures. Those happen when you roll 10 below the target number. Notably, they, there is no critical failure for making a strike most of the time. And if you were to imagine the four degrees of success from worst to best, rolling a natural 20 means that once you determine where you fall, you raise your category by one. Natural one makes you lower your category by one. It means that those plus ones and plus twos have effectively twice as much power as what people coming from other tabletop role-playing games might be used to, because it's twice as likely to change the degree of success. And also in Pathfinder, this degrees of success system applies to many more types of roles in the game. The demoralized check had more effect on a critical success. Seeking an undetected enemy, a critical success would have made that goblin observed to them, not just hidden. This has pluses and minuses. One thing I consider a plus is that it leads to more standout moments during a typical battle. One of those goblins critically succeeding, taking zero damage is unexpected. And also if they had critically failed in their saving throw against burning hands, that damage would have doubled. Another benefit is that it rewards teamwork. Players can make a critical hit happen if they combine their efforts together. One player, or sometimes more than one player, can set up that fighter to do a critical hit. One downside, however, is that you can't eyeball the result just by looking at the die roll. One other effect that this creates, and we didn't, we couldn't really see it in the demonstration, is that when you're dealing with creatures that are a few levels lower than you or a few levels higher than you, you definitely feel the difference when you cast Fireball and half of the Hobgoblins take double damage or when you're going up against a giant and they are critically hitting you with every other blow. Next we look at mobility in combat and I need to give the caveat that this was not representative of D&D 5e because the uh, classic encounter I chose has a monster, the goblin, that has a ability that allows it to use a bonus action to disengage or hide. However, we still were able to see the tendencies between the two systems in D&D 5e. Movement is free, and I think that was a design goal of the system compared to previous editions. By not having movement compete with your main action, you could still do your main action and change where you are in the combat. They additionally said that you could split up your movement, you can dart out, fire a spell, and then go back behind that wall. However, in practice, they also kept opportunity attacks, which disincentivize movement. You don't want to walk away from an enemy and give them the, the chance to attack you for free. Also, if your speed is the same as the enemy's speed, you don't really gain much by walking away from them. They can just simply walk up to you and close the gap because movement didn't cost anything for them. However, if you have a greater speed, Arguably, you have more effect than you have in Pathfinder because you force that enemy to use its dash action to reach you. Now, one intended effect uh, is for this to give more meaning to and power to melee characters. By walking up to an enemy, 
you force them to stay in place. You also make it harder for enemies to get past you to get at, let's say, a wizard in your backline. This limits the amount of movement that happens in the combat. The goblin then ran up to the fighter early in the combat. Had it survived, had it been a little tougher, would have pinned down everyone that it was standing next to and helped protect the archers in the back lines. In Pathfinder, first of all, there's the three action economy. You can stride with an action, and that also means you can stride three times on your turn. However, a trade-off is that you cannot split your movement. This also means it's harder for someone to go from behind a wall, snipe an enemy, and then go back behind the wall especially spellcasters in Pathfinder, because many spells take two actions. If you step out from behind your safe wall and cast a spell, you're left standing out in the open. Very importantly, creatures do not have attacks of opportunity, the majority of them. This means that even when two sides meet up with each other in melee, they might still just move away from you and go after someone else instead. You can move twice your speed with two stride actions and still make an attack on your turn. And the way that flanking works, where if you and your ally are on opposite sides of a foe, it is flat-footed to both of your melee attacks. So there's often shifting going on in battle where you're trying to gain flanking and or avoid being flanked. This together means that there usually is more moving around the battlefield that I see in Pathfinder fights. One thing that the 5e system does is that standing right up against somebody who makes ranged attacks tends to lock them down because they get disadvantaged when they attack anybody in that situation and getting away from you will provoke your opportunity attack. That is not as true in Pathfinder. But they do give more primacy to melee fighters by making melee do more damage. Attacking with finesse weapons and bows in Pathfinder does not add your dexterity to your damage. Also, ranged attackers have to be closer. <laughs> the ranges tend to be shorter. Spells tend to be only 30 feet in Pathfinder, and this lessens the tendency of having a ranged character sniping the entire battlefield without penalty. This incentivizes closing in or getting away, but not too far away, in order to press an advantage or avoid damage. There are pros and cons to being 35 feet away from an enemy and 55 feet away from an enemy. This gives more mechanical impact to changing where you're standing, therefore incentivizing more movement. And then finally in Pathfinder, there is the fact that some creatures do have attack of opportunity, and the creatures that do normally hit really hard. They key off of more triggers. They trigger if you try to make a ranged attack. They can also disrupt your action if you're trying to cast many spells or physically manipulate something. So creatures that have attacks of opportunity can lock down somebody who makes range attacks or is a spellcaster, who still has a way out if they are willing to pay the action tax of stepping away as a single action before they do other things. Now we move on to the comparative difficulty of the fight in the two systems. First of all, we have two different ratings that we need to acknowledge. The Dungeons & Dragons Goblin fight was a deadly fight. It was the highest rating of difficulty for a fight in D&D, whereas in Pathfinder, it was a moderate fight. Generally, people who have played both systems, and I have, say that a moderate fight in Pathfinder feels about as difficult as a deadly fight in Dungeons & Dragons. One of the reasons for this is that between battles in Pathfinder, you often can heal to full and restore much of your party's fighting ability uh, in the interim. I would say that in this example, both fights felt similarly deadly, but in the Pathfinder fight, I was favoring the goblins more with my dice rolls. I had to game the dice rolls against the player characters. There was many misses that fighter had, for example, that should have been hits. So it would seem that these two ratings were accurate. However, I think there's a couple of nuances at play here. First is that the 5e characters were more likely to die in that example because of the massive damage rule. The rogue, she just needed to have been struck by something that would have brought her to negative maximum hit points, minus nine in this case. Another reason for this is that in Pathfinder, the characters had more hit points because you add hit points from your ancestry. And instant death is harder to achieve. A single blow needs to inflict double your maximum hit point total. 
So as a result, whether the party would prevail was less assured in the D&D fight. This is something that's often said about low-level fights in D&D, and it's especially true at level 1. This becomes less true as the party gains a couple of levels. It becomes harder to meet the massive damage death condition. The casters have more spell slots to use Healing Word or other magic to bring somebody up from unconsciousness, and spells like Revivify can bring someone back from the dead in the middle of combat at the cost of a third level spell slot. In contrast, in Pathfinder, the ultimate outcome of this fight was more assured. The goblins did not do much damage. They were nowhere near threatening to do double their maximum hit points in a single blow though higher level enemies can do that in Pathfinder. But basically it wasn't deserving of the word deadly. However, something we also saw was that tactics could swing the needle. The goblins who had bows had an incentive to set up a single very accurate attack because of the way critical hits are determined. And with those bows having the deadly d10 trait, those critical hits were much more damaging than the regular hits. So while the ultimate outcome of the battle in Pathfinder, whether any characters would die, was more predictable. But there was a little more ability for tactics to determine that outcome. And because the ultimate of the outcome is more predictable, the feeling of difficulty can also be more reliably tuned. So for a game master who wants to have more control in tuning the difficulty of a fight, Pathfinder's overall design is better at supporting that. Meanwhile, in D&D, at low levels, death is more likely to happen through luck, and that danger lessens significantly after several levels. And a DM will need to not rely on challenge ratings when building encounters to challenge that party. We now look at the death and dying systems. To summarize, in D&D, you make a death saving throw on each of your turns. Three successes mean you stabilize. Three failures mean you die. A natural 20 lets you stand up again with a hit point and act on your turn. And a natural one gives you two failures. Any damage you take, it gives you a failure. A critical hit against you gives you two failures. In Pathfinder, when you get knocked out, your initiative changes to immediately before the current creature acting in initiative. There is a dying track that you can ride and go up and down as you make recovery checks. When you are healed back up, you gain the wounded condition, making being knocked out more dangerous. And when you're wounded too, a single critical hit can kill you. Having spellcasters with healing word prepared lessens that danger, and running low on spell slots becomes very dangerous. Whereas in Pathfinder, there tend to be more ways to heal. An elixir of life costs three gold. Characters can get the battle medicine feat within the first couple of levels to heal people mid-combat. After the randomness and low number of spell slots at low levels, in general, it is easier to survive in Dungeons and Dragons. The wounded condition prevents what many D&D players call the yo-yo healing effect, in which characters are knocked out, then get brought back up again with healing word, get knocked out, get brought back up again with little sense of danger, so long as the spellcasters have healing word. The wounded condition creates a heightening drama in a long drawn out fight. Also, if you are critically hit and brought straight to dying too, which is not that rare. If you don't have any hero points, you are one roll away from dying on your very first check. If you roll a natural one or natural two, you will critically fail and hit dying four, which I will leave a timestamp showing that happening in a campaign. And what happens sometimes is that a character is brought back up at wounded two and is one critical hit away from death, and so they back away from the front lines. Additionally, there are more consequences to getting knocked out in Pathfinder. As we saw in the example, the fighter that rolled a natural 20 was able to immediately stand up from the ground, run forward, draw their weapon, and make an attack. Because there's little consequence to actually getting knocked out, what's often considered optimal in D&D circles is to not heal somebody until after they get knocked out. You definitely don't want to do that in Pathfinder, however, and when you heal them, you want to heal them a lot because they have the wounded condition, and also standing up takes one whole action, and you need to interact with every item in order to put it in your hand again. Whereas Healing Word was kind of free for the cleric, action economy-wise in D&D, in Pathfinder it costs two people most of their turns to recover. 
Now we compare the spellcasting systems. In D&D, we have what I'm calling flexible spellcasting, because that's what it's called in Pathfinder. There's an archetype that any prepared spellcaster can take in Pathfinder. When D&D initially came out, it was called modified Vancean spellcasting. Vancean being the traditional fire and forget way of preparing and using your spells. You still decide in the morning which spells you prepare for that day, but what you have instead are a set of spell slots that are more like your general spellcasting power for that day, and your prepared spells are your library for your spell slots. Whereas in our combat example, our cleric and wizard were prepared spellcasters, or Vancian in the traditional D&D sense, where they prepared actual spell castings, and when they cast the spell, they no longer could cast that spell again, unless they prepared it more than once. We did not see spontaneous spellcasters in this combat example. They work similarly to the sorcerer, bard, and ranger in D&D in having a limited number of spells known that they can use their spell slots to cast. They are not able to upcast or heighten spells freely like in D&D. So in general, spellcasters have less flexibility in Pathfinder. And that'll be the theme of this uh, topic. Uh, spellcasters generally are weaker in Pathfinder compared to their D&D counterparts. Flexible spellcasting requires less planning ahead. We didn't see it here because our cleric and wizard had only two spell slots each, but as they level up and gain more spell slots, there generally becomes less stress and consequence in using your spell slots, especially your low-level ones. In D&D, some first-level spells are quite strong. So, for example, when you become a fifth-level wizard and you cast a shield to protect yourself from that attack, you are confident that you can cast shield eight more times today if you have to. Whereas in Pathfinder, if you were to cast any similar spell, you would know that's your only casting of that spell for the day. It means decisions that are more consequential, which for some people, I'm included, I like those challenging decisions. And uh, others might not, however. Another thing we saw was that the spells tended to be stronger in D&D compared to Pathfinder. And also, many of the spells in Pathfinder required two actions, which is more than was needed to make a weapon attack. Also, we saw that many of the spells had shorter ranges. The spellcasters had to be closer to the enemy. The last topic is party endurance. Of course, both parties needed to rest. The Dungeons & Dragons group had hit dice to spend to restore their hit points, which are a limited daily pool. At first level, they only have one hit die each. Whereas in Pathfinder, they had a reusable skill, medicine, that could restore 2d8 hit points on a success. They, they were limited in how frequently they could benefit from it. Each character could have treat wounds attempted on them only once per hour, but it was theoretically unlimited. After one to four hours, a typical level one party would be able to get back to full health. When they get some medicine skill feats, that's usually reduced to less than an hour. Also, there are some focus spells that we did not see here, like a paladin's lay on hands or a druid's goodberry that can be recharged every 10 minutes. So we immediately see that there is a adventuring day in effect in D&D. The system is built so that there's a limited number of encounters that the party can endure. At some point, they are running on fumes and have to go back and recharge. Now, Pathfinder has daily resources also that has spell slots for spellcasters. But at least in the hit points area, they can get back to full health, assuming no wandering monsters or other circumstances pressuring them to press forward. And it's not just hit points. There were also focus spells, as I went over, that can be recharged. Also, the cantrips tend to be more powerful in Pathfinder. In D&D, they increase at 5th level, 11th level, and 17th level, increase in power. And in Pathfinder, they, that happens with every odd-numbered level. So Pathfinder spellcasters that run out of their spell slots are able to run on fumes that are a bit stronger than the fumes in D&D. To be precise, the power drop-off from their spell slots to their cantrips is smaller. 
What this means is that D&D is designed around an adventuring day, and in the Dungeon Master's Guide, it says to run a party through six to eight encounters per day. Whereas in Pathfinder, generally the party's power level is less affected by adventuring over the course of the day. That does make it easier to make a working encounter balancing system. Also, this here was about out of combat healing. In combat healing in D&D is more reliant on spell slots. In Pathfinder, you can use your medicine skill, other resources, focus spells to heal, resources that don't have a daily counter in the middle of combat. This is the other side of the coin of having stronger spell casting, because one of the main ways D&D seeks to keep spellcasters in balance with martial classes is the idea that spellcasters, while having more powerful effects, can only do those effects a limited number of times per day. This does present some difficulties though for DMs because that very fact often incentivizes a party to do a long rest to get all of its daily resources back. This is why in counterbalancing in D&D is often kind of done on the fly after initiative is rolled because it was impossible for the DM to know in advance where the party would be resources wise. Another effect of this is that it's possible to have, even in a moderate or low fight, monsters that can crit you and knock you out quite easily because those hit points can be restored in the interim. So that's my third Pathfinder Law School course using the same battle in the two systems in order to make some more focused comparisons between the two systems. I hope it was helpful in helping you decide what systems you want to try out and understanding the designs of these systems so that we can improve future tabletop RPG designs. I try to be as fair as possible, even though my preferences are clear. I hope I achieved my objective. If you'd like a deeper dive into overall how I think Pathfinder addresses certain problems in the history of combat-heavy tactical RPGs, check out the second video in my Law School series. Leave a comment about what you agree with, disagree with, anything that I didn't point out in comparing the two systems. Like and subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about my future law school courses. The ones that I'm planning are listed on the screen. It's a series of videos meant to highlight some what I view are strengths about the system and to teach people who are new to the system how to play and how to avoid some common mistakes that new players might make. When it makes sense, I will be making comparisons to D&D and sometimes other tabletop RPG systems. So I hope you have enjoyed this video. I've been the Rules Lawyer, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.